The Venerable Master Xuanhua was a deeply wise and compassionate teacher who dedicated his life to teaching and helping all living beings. He laid the foundation for Buddhism in the West by translating Buddhist texts, creating a fully ordained Sangha, and advocating education. The Venerable Master was born in rural northeastern China in 1918. When he was 11, he saw a human corpse and realized the impermanence of all things, and resolved to cultivate the way. At the age of 18, he started a free school for the village children. After his mother passed away when he was 19, he became a novice Buddhist monk and observed the Chinese filial practice of three years mourning by building a simple hut and sitting in continuous meditation there. When the Venerable Master was meditating by his mother's grave in Dongbei, uh, when he was still, I believe, 19 years old, he had a vision of the uh, sixth patriarch of the uh, Chan school come to him and tell him that he should go to the West to bring the true Dharma to the West. And so I think this will be his uh, lasting legacy. When his Dharma lineage predecessor, the Venerable Chan Master Xu Ming, passed away, the Master was in Hong Kong where he founded three Buddhist monasteries and taught the Buddha Dharma to many disciples. While he was in Hong Kong, some of his lay disciples invited him to go to the United States. He arrived in San Francisco in 1962. In San Francisco, he stayed in a cold and windowless basement for a period, during which the master called himself a monk in the grave. There, the master started to have regular contact with young Americans who were interested in meditation. In 1968, about 30 American students from the University of Washington in Seattle came to San Francisco for a lecture and cultivation session with the Venerable Master. In Seattle, they had a program in Buddhist studies and a, a number of young people who were interested not only in studying Buddhism but also practicing Buddhism. Uh, I told them about the Master and they suggested that we invite him to Seattle to have a week-long meditation session in Seattle. So we wrote him a letter and he had one of his disciples, Nancy Lovett, write a letter back saying that he couldn't come to Seattle because if he came to Seattle there would be an earthquake in San Francisco and that we should come to San Francisco and have the session there. So we all went to San Francisco over spring break and had a week-long meditation session at the Ten Ho Miao in Chinatown in San Francisco where he was then staying. After the week-long meditation session, uh, we asked him whether we could come in the summer and have another session. Instead of a, uh, agreeing to a week session, he talked us into coming to San Francisco for a ten-week-long um, study and practice session during which he explained to us the Shurangama Sutra. So that's what happened. Uh, during the summer of uh, um, 1968 there were uh, a large number of young people from the Seattle area, some from Los Angeles and some from the San Francisco Bay Area who all came to the Buddhist lecture hall there in Chinatown, the old Tian Ho Miao, uh, to study with the Master. Soon after the session, five Americans, three men and two women, decided to leave the home life and become Buddhist monks and nuns. Once I knew him, then I had very um, specific intent. Uh, he changed my life because that wasn't where I was headed at all in my life. And once I met him, that's where I wanted to go. So everything about my life from that point on became focused on how was I going to get to be able to be around him to be a monastic and to study the principles of Buddhism. In 1972, the Master held the first formal full ordination ceremonies for Buddhist monks and nuns in the West at Gold Mountain Dhyana Monastery in San Francisco. 
In total, the Master held seven ordinations between 1972 and 1992 in the United States for progressively larger numbers of people. He ordained over 200 people from countries all over the world, and he taught and helped many, many more. It was so evident his wisdom and his compassion and his virtue. I never had met anyone like that before or since. And he was able to connect with us and know the inside of us, know our minds and know our character and know what we needed in a way that was just amazing. Uh, when I first laid eyes on Master Shenhua, my feeling was, uh-oh, here it comes, now I'm in trouble. Because he, I had this feeling that there was no escape. And it wasn't entirely pleasant. It was like, because I was, I felt kind of like there was a spotlight on my mind. And it was very bright. And I didn't talk to him. And it, I asked my friend, for, who was now Big Shu Hong Yo, I said, can I go talk to him? He says, well, you don't talk to him. He'll talk to you if, if he wants to. And he didn't. And I says, well, often he doesn't talk to new people. So that was the first time I saw Master Shrinwa. And I drove back across the bridge after having a delicious vegetarian lunch and learning how to bow. I didn't know the Buddhist bow at that point. I thought we meditated. Because that's what I'd done in Japan. And I had been the big Buddhist everywhere I went because I had lived in the Zen temple in Japan. But compared to Gold Mountain Monastery, uh, it was a very small pond indeed in Japan. So uh, I went back across the bay and I didn't know it, but I already started to make plans to tie up all of my business there and shut down all my bad habits and leave all of my um, untrustworthy, unreliable friends and start coming back. And sure enough, in the next few weeks, in the next few months, I, every Saturday, I would find myself across the bay, Gold Mountain Monastery, having another vegetarian lunch, and bowing the medicine Buddha repentance, was what we did every Saturday. Well, when I first met the abbot, I was looking for a teacher at that time, so uh, when I met the master, my first impression was uh, that he was a real master. And uh, I didn't have any wisdom, but I was able to see that he he was different than everybody. And uh, he, when he first met me, he just laughed. <laughs> he he says, "Oh, you've come, ha ha ha!" And I didn't understand why, but it, later on I understood. Well, our Shifu is this a uh, constant uh, source of energy when you're with him. He's always uh, coming up. With, he was very. Uh, a very positive person to be around. Even if you don't understand, he, he was a real sage. You may or may not know that. But you do know that he was a very energetic and very good person. He never took advantage of people. He never took advantage of his disciples. He always helped them and sacrificed himself for them. And but being with Shurfu that long, you can't help but, but realize that. Because if you didn't have a pure nature, it would come out sooner or later. If you stayed with a person long enough, you would you would realize that. But with Shrifu, you always just realize he had a pure nature. He never ever did anything that was evil or or bad or or uh, negative towards people. And the one thing he taught me most of all, he told me that when you meet when he meets somebody for the first time, he doesn't look at their face, he doesn't look at their bodies, he looks at their Buddha nature. He looks at their Buddha nature first. He says that not only people, but living beings. When he looks at an animal, he does the same thing. And he's only interested in one thing. He wants to t teach that person how to open up their wisdom, to see the Buddha nature for themselves. Listening to him lecture the sutras every day for you know, many years, and then also doing the extensive ceremonies and meditation and other practice sessions that he taught uh, was a very, very, uh, very complete and thorough way of learning Buddhism. For his disciples, he re-established the wearing of the precept sash as a sign of a member of the Sangha. He also encouraged Sangha members to follow his example of eating one meal a day at noon, 
because the Buddha instructed that monks and nuns not eat afternoon. The master established these fundamental guidelines for monastic practice. Freezing to death, we do not scheme. Starving to death, we do not beg. Dying of poverty, we ask for nothing. According with conditions, we do not change. Not changing, we accord with conditions. We adhere firmly to our three great principles. We renounce our lives to do the Buddha's work. We take the responsibility to mold our own destinies. We rectify our lives as the Sangha's work. Encountering specific matters, we understand the principles. Understanding the principles, we apply them to specific matters. We carry on the single pulse of the patriarch's mind transmission. Sherpa would say something at one time for a particular situation, for particular people, for that moment. And if you tried to take that and transfer it over as a voice of authority for another situation another time, you would get scolded because a different principle and a different teaching would apply there. So even in trying, and this is very much what the Buddha did. If you think about the Buddha uh, at his last statement, he avoided saying, I gave you a teaching, I gave you a dharma. I simply taught you a method to free yourselves from suffering. Quickly cultivate this and don't linger. But don't attach to the dharma. And then there's that famous parable of the raft. You use the raft to get to the other shore. Once you're on the other shore, you don't use the raft anymore. So the same thing, Sherpa in that spirit always taught us according to the situation. And every time we tried later to say, oh, Sherpa said, we would get scolded. To the point, at one point he said, anybody who says Sherpa said after this is really going to get it. <laughs> so we stopped doing that because it indicated to, to, to Shurfu that we were not understanding what it was about. You have to be spontaneous, you have to be responsibly functioning with conditions, and you have to find the principle that applies for the situation. You cannot simply say, Shurfu said it, go on. The Master also attempted to heal the 2,000-year-old rift between Mahayana and Theravada monastic communities by encouraging cordial relations between the Sanghas inviting distinguished Theravada monks to preside with him in monastic ordination ceremonies and initiating talks aimed at resolving areas of difference. In order to strengthen central organization and in recognition of his growing number of American disciples, in December 1968, the Buddhist lecture hall was expanded into the newly incorporated Sino-American Buddhist Association. As that organization became more international in scope, in 1984, the name of the organization was officially changed to the Dharma Realm Buddhist Association. Well, Dharma Realm Buddhist Association is based on the master and his vision. And his vision is, his one vision to me, I'm speaking for myself, is that he wanted us all to become Buddhas. Number one, his agenda was to make everybody realize that they have a Buddha nature and to be, want to become Buddhas. And that the whole purpose for DRBA is to, to help people do that. In 1976, the Master established the sagely city of 10,000 Buddhas, which now encompasses almost 500 acres of land at Wonderful Enlightenment Mountain in Northern California. Besides the city of 10,000 Buddhas in Ukiah, Dharma Realm Buddhist Association has established monasteries around the United States, which are Gold Mountain Monastery in San Francisco, the Institute for World Religions and Berkeley Buddhist Monastery in Berkeley, Gold Sage Monastery in San Jose, City of the Dharma Realm in West Sacramento, Gold Wheel Monastery in Los Angeles, Blessings, Prosperity, and Longevity Monastery and Long Beach Monastery in Long Beach, Gold Summit Sagely Monastery in Seattle, and Avatamska Vihara in Potomac, Maryland in the Washington metropolitan area. Internationally, Dharma Round Buddhist Association has monasteries in Canada, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Malaysia, and Australia. In Canada, Gold Buddha Monastery in Vancouver, Avatamsaka Monastery in Calgary. In Taiwan, Dharma Realm Buddhist Books Distribution Association in Taipei, Taichung, and Kaohsiung, Amitabha Monastery in Hualien, and Dharma Realm Sagely Monastery in Liuquei, Kaohsiung County. 
in Hong Kong, Buddhist Lecture Hall, and Sixing Chan Monastery, and in Australia, Gold Coast Monastery. At first, in the branches, because there were so few of us, and he would send us two at a time, usually sometimes three to a branch. Um, we didn't do a lot. We didn't have a lot of activity there. Um, we were sent there mostly to watch the door, to do some self-cultivation, and uh, and then occasionally, and to of course do our daily ceremonies and our evening lecture and so on, and then occasionally have a dharma assembly. But um, Shivu didn't emphasize recruiting new disciples. You know, it, that wasn't. It didn't seem that. That's what he wanted us to do. He only wanted us to reliably cultivate. And he said, as long as we reliably cultivated, then people would naturally want to come. Um, and he only asked us to do as much as we were physically capable of doing. You know, so if there were only two or three of us there, you know, we had to keep the place clean. We had to cook our daily meals, and do our daily cultivation. Um, you know. We couldn't do a whole lot else beside that. So, um, so these branches kind of grew gradually. Uh, um, Gold Buddha, in particular, um, was it was very close to Chinatown, which was good. Uh, it was convenient for especially the elderly elderly women. You know, I remember once Shifu, I was there, and one of the elderly ladies came up and bowed to Shifu and gave him a red envelope. And Shifu took the envelope and he, he, he cherished it, you know. And Shifu said, this dollar is more important to me than if, uh, you know, a rich person came in and offered me a million dollars. He said, these are the people, like these elderly ladies, who, who, who hold up the dharma. You know, so that that um, that moved me quite a bit. You know, I mean, you you see how how Shifu's mind was totally. Uh, what can I say? His only concern was cultivation, and and he everyone for him was equal. Everyone, absolutely everyone, equally deserved his attention and his time. The master not only lectured daily on the sutras, but trained a whole staff of translators and taught many disciples how to lecture on the sutras themselves. He lectured on the four major Mahayana sutras, completing the Sharangama Sutra, the Lotus or Dharma Flower Sutra, and the Avatamsaka Sutra, and finishing a substantial portion of the Nirvana Sutra, as well as many other Buddhist works. However, much of the master's teaching took place outside of his formal Dharma lectures. For him, every situation was an opportunity to help people become aware of their faults and change them, and to develop their inherent wisdom. He was a living, breathing representative of what the Buddhist teachings were about. Uh, when I first recognized who he was, uh, I saw that he was uh, completely selfless, that there was no, uh, no separate individual uh, inside him that uh, was different from who I was at the deepest level of my being. And I saw that he operated out of completely selfish compassion, uh, for everyone, all of the time, in every single moment, in very small matters and in very large matters. And in all the years I, I knew him and uh, uh, spent a lot of time with him, uh, I never saw him do the slightest selfish thing or put his own welfare uh, before anybody else's welfare. And so that was, he, he was a, a wonderful role model, I think that's probably the most important thing, and a living, breathing example of, of the Buddha's teaching for us. And of course, um, he, he was so incredibly compassionate. It was uh, wonderful just to be around him all of the time and to uh, be the recipient of that compassion 
and to try to do uh, whatever we could to, to help him in spreading the Buddha Dharma in the world. The Master traveled extensively and tirelessly to lecture and teach throughout the United States and Canada, made several major trips to Asia, and also visited South America and Europe, sometimes at great cost to his health. However, the Master considered the Dharma more important than his life. I traveled with him as his attendant to different countries like uh, Hong Kong, Indonesia, Thailand, Taiwan, Singapore, Malaysia. And in those situations I could see that the Master taught people in different ways according to their cultures and their understanding. And it's, uh, it's pretty remarkable. There was a, the first delegation in Malaysia, I think it was 1978. Uh, I traveled with him, and so I was with him all the time, you know, every day. And so I got to see him really firsthand, like, all the time. And so all of those traits that people, you know, th you know say that he has, that he's uh, completely selfless, that he doesn't pay any attention, that he's to the, he knows exactly what's going on in the surroundings, but he's not attached, he's... Uh, always compassionate, he's always patient, and he's always understanding all the cause and effect that's going on, all these things that people think. When you're around him all the time, you actually see that all those things are really true. At a distance, you think he might have all those traits, but when you're actually with him all the time, you actually see, actually manifest all those states, even when he's in private. So he's not like doing something in public that people are seeing that's different than what he's doing when he's in private. When he's in private and just sitting in his own space, not actually in any kind of public gathering at all. He's exactly the same. He says, do not be superstitious. Don't be upside down. Don't follow me. Follow wisdom. And, I, and then he repeated. He said, you understand? Don't go don't. You're not following me. You want to follow wisdom. Follow principle. Uh, and from that point, I realized again that he was different in the sense that his relationship to his disciples was not to have a lot of disciples who were following him, but really to be an expedient to turn and point a lot of people to what he was following. So he was saying, don't follow me, follow what I am following. So as soon as you were ready to stand on your own, you were pushed out of the nest. He didn't want to gather people around to have a large following. He only simply wanted to teach and transform people to help them get along. Um. In 1970, the Master founded the Buddhist Text Translation Society with the eventual goal of translating the entire Buddhist canon into English and other languages. The Master saw clearly that reliable translations into English with readable and understandable commentaries were essential to the understanding and practice of the Buddha Dharma by Westerners. Also in 1970, the Master founded Vajra Bodhi C, a monthly journal of Orthodox Buddhism. The Master felt that one of the weaknesses of Buddhism in China was that it did not give high priority to education and failed to develop a widespread network of Buddhist schools and universities. In order to begin to remedy that situation in the West, the Venerable Master founded Dharma Realm Buddhist University instilling goodness and developing virtue elementary and secondary schools, and developed financial aid programs for needy and deserving students. The Master taught that education is the best national defense. He counseled that in elementary school, children should be taught filial respect, in secondary school, love of country and loyalty to it, and at the university level, Students should learn not only professional skills, but a sense of personal responsibility for improving the world they live in. In consonance with his Dharma realm vision, the Master often said that Buddhism was too limiting a label for the Buddha's teaching, and often referred to it as the teaching of living beings. Just as he was critical of sectarian divisions within Buddhism as not being in the true spirit of the Dharma, he felt that people should not be attached to interreligious distinctions either, that it is important for people of all religions to learn from the strengths of each religious tradition. The Master established the Institute of World Religions in Berkeley, California in 1994, 
and initiated and joined an interreligious dialogue and activity many times. And at his heart, Sherpa never left just that very simple, um, solitary, um, unattached state that he had achieved when he was younger. Even though he grew older and took on all this stuff, it was all without any attachment or any personal investment whatsoever. It was just based on compassion. Uh, and to the point, he said, and when I die, um, I remember him saying this, um, don't make a big fuss about this. Uh, don't get all attached. Um, I don't want any memorial. I don't want any shrine. And I don't want anything left behind. I came from empty space. I'm going back to empty space. In 1995, the Venerable Master entered Nirvana. Throughout his life, the Venerable Master was widely known for his selfless humility and his compassion for all living beings. He constantly worked for peace and harmony throughout the world on all levels, between people, between species, between religions, and between nations. He came here even though uh, it involved him in uh, great suffering and difficulty that he could have avoided if he stayed in China. And uh, 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 created the foundations for the flourishing of the right dharma here in the West. And those uh, foundations were primarily uh, giving, starting a Western Sangha, uh, a a community of fully ordained uh, monks and nuns that included Westerners. And secondly, uh, he set up the Buddhist text, Buddhist text Translation Society in order to uh, translate the fundamental teachings of the Buddha into English. I think those are probably the most important things. Also, uh, during his whole life, he uh, always advocated education. Uh, not only monastic education, but education on the primary and secondary and university levels. And to that end, he started primary and secondary schools in Dharma Realm Buddhist University, and also very, very quietly uh, supported uh, poor students so that they could continue their educations. So that also, I think, uh, is a great legacy. I think it's important to realize that he was very, very careful to plant the right seeds and not to be expedient in a way to set things up that would make a big flash and then would not last. So we are just beginning to see the fruition of what he's done and it may be quite a while until the, those seeds grow into mighty oaks and uh, uh, we see the full result of everything that he has done.